What we say at Family ID is where family identity is strong, peer pressure is weak. But where family identity is weak, peer pressure is strong. In fact, it's insurmountable. And that doesn't just go for our teenagers at school and all, on the playground for our younger ones. And that goes for us as parents. And it goes for me as a husband and a dad. It goes for my wife. Peer pressure is real. But when we understand who we are and when we can grasp onto something that is identity and say, no, 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 I have strength because I can do these things. Hey, that builds confidence. Hi, welcome to the Family Teams podcast. Our goal here is to help your family become a multi-generational team on mission by providing you with biblically rooted concepts, tools, and rhythms. Your hosts are Jeremy Pryor and Jefferson Bethke, and we can't wait to chat about all things family. Hey guys, welcome back to the Family Teams podcast. Um, I'm here today with Derek England, and Derek is part of an organization called uh, Family ID uh, out of Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. So Derek, thanks for jumping on the podcast with me. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah. So I'm excited. Derek and I were uh, chatting um, a couple weeks ago. Uh, we had a mutual friend and I got to talk to Greg Gunn as well. I think he's the founder of Family ID mm -hmm. and we just had a great conversation and there's so much synergy. And I was like, okay, like I'd love to hear the backstory. Like how did this organization start? What do you guys do? Um, and as we, as Derek is kind of leading us into the story, I want to like try to like understand how this dovetails with family teams, maybe areas too where um, where there are different strengths in these organizations. But I, I feel like, yeah, I just want I want you guys all to get to hear uh, what they're doing and and where it came from. So I, I got really inspired and um, I wanted to to go layer deeper. So yeah, thanks for doing this with me, Derek. I just want to start. Yeah, um, I'd love for for maybe you can introduce yourself um, and then we'll dive into the organization. Absolutely. And so. Name's Derek, obviously. I've got a wife, Gina. She and I have been married for 20 years, last November. Uh, and we have two incredible kiddos, 15-year-old um, daughter, Sawyer, and a 14-year-old son named Jack. Um, and so the, we're us four, no more. Uh, we're a nice square family, yeah. you know. Um, two boys, two girls. We, we cover all the bases. And um, we are truly blessed to have and walk through and walk out a family identity that we got, we received 12 years ago um, through walking to family ID. Awesome. Um, it was 2012. Um, our kids were little, two and three years old. And Gina and I both come from divorced parents. And so as we're raising our kids, we don't know exactly what are all the best practices, what are, what are the pitfalls or, or landmines to stay away from. And we just knew hey, I know some stuff over here I don't want. How do I get all the stuff that I do want over here? Um, and then I ran into Greg Gunn, who started and founded Family ID. Um, and Greg founded it in 1997 and has devoted 25, 20, 28 years towards building, developing, and growing this organization. Um, it came out of his uh, church at the time. His pastor went away through a weekend. And uh, when he came back, Greg asked him, hey, where were you? And he had been on his annual family planning retreat. And Greg was a leader inside a financial organization, led many, many, many people. But the thought of having a family planning retreat was nowhere in his brain. Um, just like so many of us, it's easy and it makes sense. I mean, this is what family teams does as well. It's, it's so easy to put it um, goals, directives, KPIs, quarterly goals, mission, vision, all that stuff, yeah. they work, yeah. but we never translate it over to him. Yeah. Um, so Greg did that. He launched it in his Sunday school class. It continued to grow. Um, and then in 2010, he went full time and uh, 501c3 contribution supported organization. He took it full time and launched and has been doing it ever since. We, Gina and I, got introduced to it in 2012, walked through it, understood, okay, this is who we are. Um, as in England, we know that we are called to be a beacon of light and a pillar of strength to a dark and crumbling world. Mm. That's the calling on our lives and what we're called to live out through five core values. Mm. Awesome. And so is, is that uh, the kind of often the entry point 
like that you begin to develop a, a family calling, like try to clarify what that is and then, and then some values? Yeah, for the most part. And that's the way it has been um, right. historically for Family ID. And that was kind of, as Greg's been growing it, that is how he structured his ministry, okay. was kind of seminar or workshop based. Uh, going to churches, organizations, spending an afternoon or a weekend walking through and unpacking the different layers of, of family and and how people do things or should do things or don't want to do things and, and coming out with um, mission, vision, and core values. Okay. Um, in the last couple of years, and, and we just launched this year, January 2024, um, what we call the family assessment. It's the family ID assessment. And what we found is um, with Craig's experience and my experience that there are what we call four core principles in a family, uh, family identity, family purpose, family direction, and then application, um, identity, purpose, direction, and application. And where a family is strongest to weakest and, and how that sequence works out from strongest to weakest creates some real tendencies and commonalities in families. Um, and so we started you know, drawing circles and, and finding commonalities. And then we put real cute names on them. And so uh, we've got, we identified 16 family types that we kind of put families into categories and not one is better than the other. Okay. Right? It's not, it's not a scaled thing, um, but you might be a resilient family or a uh, trailblazing family, focused family. Mm-hmm. And it's, it, it is based on your sequencing of identity, purpose, direction, and application, which one's strongest, which one's weakness. And then we give essentially a SWOT analysis for your family, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Okay. And that has become, Jeremy, the real front door to family ID. Wow. Because it, I'm sure just like family teams, hey, nobody wakes up at two o'clock in the morning and says, you know what? I need some family core values. That's what I need. Right. <laughs> so taking people from unaware to aware has been mm. our, our biggest struggle for 20 years. I, I've been on the team for five, but, um, and so this has become a real good front door to take people from unaware to aware about living intentionally in their family. That's great. So they come online, they can, they can jump in, take, a, take an assessment. And as they, as it kind of figures out, where they're at, it, it begins to identify, okay, this is, we've seen these 16 types of families. You guys roughly fall into this category. Um, and, and, and once you discover that type, what is, what is the strength of that? What, what is the value of learning that about your family? Well, so then not only can you take it, but you can invite your other family members to take it. And it, um, right. it puts together and combines all your results and gives you a full 360 view of your family type. Mm-hmm. And then, Hey, you have common language. You can identify strengths and weaknesses. And if you want to put confidence and clarity behind your family type, then um, you can move into the next phase, which is what we call a family ID masterclass, which is a walking through the process of putting into writing identity, purpose, and direction, and then putting a plan on how to apply those things um, in and through your family. And it, there's a book about it. I've heard pastors say it all the time, right? When you know who you are, then you'll know what to do. And so that's the real goal is when you know you are a resilient family and your easiest or or your strength is to be high purpose related um, or I guess high vision related, hey, you're thinking long or, but you might need to work to develop a little bit strong relationships in the family. And then you can go to work in developing that to balance it out a little bit. Yes. That sounds like my family <laughs> need to constantly be I'm like, let's just live into what's going to look like 300 years from now. Oh yeah. That's we've right. got diapers to change or there's actual parts to like shepherd, you know? Um, I'm curious Wait, what, who's going to fold the laundry. We've got to fold laundry. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's so passe. But, um, well, I'd love to hear so about your family, Derek. So, so what is the England family type and what, what is, how has that helped you, you guys in particular? Well, we are the harmonious family. Um, which is highest in identity Mm. and, um, lowest in direction. And so we are very relational. I mean, one of our family core values is being radically protective of quality time. Mm. 
And so as a result, hey, we're very relationship driven and we want to make sure that there is harmony um, and unity in and through our family. One of the other core values is we have enduring family unity. And so those, I believe, have shaped us into a harmonious family. Um, Jeremy, I'll, I'll tell you this. Don't, this is between you and me. And, okay. um, don't, don't let the cat out of the bag. But honestly, I've, I've got the greatest family in the world. And my two kids, they're 13 months apart. And they're best, they're best friends. Hmm. They don't fight. They don't bicker. They don't talk back. They don't throw fits. Like <laughs> it's, it's incredible just how wonderful they are. And I enjoy spending time with my kids. Uh, I joke and say, why wouldn't I? They're a perfect mix between my two favorite people in the world, me and my wife. <laughs> and so uh, of course I want to spend time with them, but it is, um, recognizing that we are a harmonious family and relationship is it's easiest and natural for us. And we've got to push ourselves in let's take extra work to identify some goals, to live on purpose. How does God want us to live us out and, and impact his kingdom on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis. Let's put I some see. goals out there and, and let's make it happen. So you, you guys, you guys just sort of in your flesh, you could just enjoy the harmoniousness of the four That's of you. It. And then, <laughs> and then maybe, okay, there's a world out there that actually needs, needs this. And so that, that, that helps you guys. Okay. How do we overcome that and make sure that we are setting goals and figuring out how to make an impact? That's exactly right. And, and in that, um, I can't think off the top of my head, I probably shouldn't, but in that, um, we, we give a PDF overview of each family type and in that it has threats, right? Like, mm. um, what could be discernment could distort into judgment or okay. what could be harmony could be become passive in the way you're saying it, you know? Um, and so those are some things just to be aware of and live out on purpose and make sure, Hey, well, are we getting too close to that line? Cause we don't want to get, we don't want to cross that line. Let's, yeah. let's be aware. All right. So help me out. Um, I don't know if you could type me in, uh, without me taking the assessment, but but, but if somebody, somebody who, who's leading a family that's very high in that direction and application, you know, what, what is there, is there a type that sort of lives in that, in that quadrant or, you know, what, what do you sense that I might be dealing with here? Um, well, you could be, um, let's see, let me look at our types here. I would probably say there's driven family, which okay. is, um, high application. So yes. it's easy for you to create next steps and go, go, go. But probably I would think you're a direction-based family, which yeah. is impactful, resilient, strategic, or trailblazing. Okay. And I'm going to guess impactful. Um, so John, uh, one of the guys at Family ID that helped helped us create this and, and and refine it, he and his wife were an impactful family, which means it was easy for them to think about how they were going to impact God's kingdom, um, but they weren't always doing it together. And so it was, hey, no, we're going to go impact over here. And I still call the impact over here. And so you end up with a divide and conquer um, thing. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We've had that problem. And then tell me a little bit, what, what, what is the, um, what are some of the elements of the profile of the strategic family? Curious. What well, that, let's look that here. Were, yeah. All right, let's that one strategic. That, that's kind of, I, I live in, in that world primarily personally and, uh, lead my family in that direction. Although I don't know that if they always go with me. So, but when, I, when we're together, like, I'm like, let's, let's do something. No one. So yeah, I'm curious. Yeah. What, what are some of the strengths or weaknesses of that one? Okay. Um, I, the strategic family is direction, then purpose, then identity, then application. Okay. Um, a strategic family, you excel in planning for the future and navigating the best path forward, showcasing a remarkable gift for aligning your compass with purpose. Your family strength lies in coordinating intentional strategies for both the present and the future, seamlessly working together with logic and critical thinking to analyze situations. Yeah, that's, so, that sounds like us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it is, right? Hey, some of the yes. cautions there is analytical approach could become overanalysis. Yes. Decisiveness could become impulsiveness hmm. or unmet expectations could lead to control dynamics of trying to lock everything down so that it meets, meets and fits all of your expectations. Okay. Totally. That's good. 
Yeah, that's a, so I just yeah, I want to give people a flavor for um for for the assessment and what it could look like to actually start to understand what kind of family you have. Now, one of the things that I find really interesting about this idea that, you know, we have these 16 types um is I think it's difficult for for people often to to think about family this way, right? To think about okay, families are different. There, everywhere I go, there's really this there's this weird almost bias that families are either um, impossible to type in any way, or they're all the same. We're all shooting for the same ideal. Mm -hmm. um, it's difficult, and one of the things I like about tools like this, even though I'm sure that you know there's no such thing as a perfect model. Um, but models that allow allow you to like converge on these common themes um, really help um, us get past those two extremes, those sort of biases that I think most people have, which is like every family is totally unique and we can't relate to anything that might be, you know, that, that might actually give us insight into how we can collectively think about these things as a family. But then then you get incredibly uniform, like we're, you know, you can only have a family that does this or like that. So yeah, talk to me a little bit about what what is the impact of of, of understanding that there is this level of variety, but also enough clarity that we can group families together and help them out in, in that, in this way. Yeah. So what we say at family ID is where family identity is strong, peer pressure is weak, but where family identity is weak, peer pressure is strong. In fact, it's insurmountable. And that, that doesn't just go for our teenagers at school and peer pressure, you know, all, on the playground for our younger ones. And that goes for us as parents. And it goes for me as a husband and a dad that goes for my wife um, is peer pressure is real. But when, when we understand who we are and when we can grasp onto something that is identity and say, no, 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 no. I am a strategic family and I have strengths because I can do these things. Hey, that builds confidence. Um, Jack's 14 and plays baseball. And um, I tell him all the time, Hey buddy, when you're at the plate, 80% of it's confidence. In life, in life, 80% yes. of it is confidence, right? Um, and so when you have that family identity and confident that you are in this family on purpose, for a purpose, hey, that creates this stickiness and this bond that now, now because we're a family and because I, I believe God created us before the foundations of the world, and it's not outside of his sovereignty to know who he's going to put in each family yes. together, right? Um, yeah. And so he did it on purpose for a collective purpose. When we know that and have confidence in that, well, now we can go live that out. Mm. Now there's something putting us together a whole lot more than just living in the same house. No, no, no. We're a strategic family. What do we want to be strategic about? Put some, put some things out there. I'll pack them. I'll, I'll tackle them down. I'll, I'll knock through walls to go through it because we're a strategic family and that's what we do. Yeah, that's good. So it gives you that confidence to push through that peer pressure that says, no, look, we're all going to look the same. We're all trying to, trying to hit. No, we're, look guys, our family looks like this and it's okay for, and it, you know, one of the things I love about that too, is it does dial down the comparison. I think families comparing to each other, the envy, if you're struggling mm -hmm. in certain mm -hmm. areas, well, that family's not struggling. Like I thought my, well, yeah, because you're different. And so looking at those That's threats, right. your, your weaknesses might be the strengths of another family and vice versa. And so that comparison game can be really dangerous. So I love that. You know, one of, one of the things that we're wrestling through a lot, you know, at family teams is, um, you know, we, we see that in the Bible, God designs family to have multi-generational connections. So mm -hmm. my mm -hmm. parents live with us. Um, they worked with us, our kids, you know, we're, we're in businesses together, starting ministries together. Um, there's, you know, there's separation, you know, appropriate amounts of separation, but also a lot of teamwork. Um, and so we're trying to find that sweet spot. We, we've lived into as a culture, this idea that, you know, every generation is, you hit, just hit the reset button and there is no connection. There's no, you know, substantial help from one generation to the next. Um, and, and we spent a lot of time in the middle East where you see much stronger family structures. Uh, that have a multi-generational component. Um, but I, I wonder what the family ID looks like across generations. Cause I can see even now with like I have two married kids and, you know, as I watch the, you know, our in-laws, you know, my son-in-law, my daughter-in-law enter the family and bringing a completely uh, new set of gifts. And then of course my kids, they have totally different gifts than me or April. Um, and I can see it. So would you guys recommend that 
like every uh, specific family branch um, take the ID and then maybe what's happening is you could end up with like a family team with like four or five types? Like, is that how yes. this looks? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Talk about how this looks multi-generationally. Oh man. Um, Jeremy, you're speaking my language right now because uh, Greg and I were sitting in the office probably two years ago. And one of the greatest questions we get, uh, whether it's seminars or whether we are one-on-one -on -one with a family or a couple generations of a family is they say, Hey, how do I push my vision down to the next future generations? And, and so we were wrestling with that question, praying through it, thinking through it. Um, and then it hit, it hit us in an instant of, oh, we're looking at it all wrong. Have you ever considered starting a family business so you can spend more time working as a family team? We've started a year long coaching program called Family Inc where you get weekly coaching with Jeremy, access to our video training for launching family businesses, and lots of ideas for businesses to start that are working for other family teams. Head over to familyteams.com and click Family Inc. to learn more, or to set up a strategy call with Jeremy to see if this might be a good fit for you. Um, we are not called to push our vision down on future generations because when when vision is pushed down on generations, we think or we believe it results in three things. And that is one, resistance, right? No, 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 I don't, I don't, want, I don't want that. Um, two, resignation, because how many times have you heard or have we heard, whatever, dad, you're just going to do it your own way and I'm just going to completely resign, right? Yes. Um, or three, resentment. Hey, there's bitterness and resentment because it feels like control when things are pushed down. Yeah. Uh, resentment can happen if, hey, if you go to this school, I can, I will financially participate. If you'll buy this house or live in this area, I can right. help support you here. Or if you do this job. Um, and so when you talk about branches, that's where I think we flip it on the head because our calling is, think about a family tree, is not to push vision down, but our calling is to push every branch up yeah. towards its calling and towards the sun, uh, S-O-N, right, is to push it mm -hmm. up based on who we are and our core values. So yes, when you have a, a new family inside your family tree, these are two unique people who are being joined together. And that dynamic is brand new, never, never before seen family dynamic. And I hope that they are close to the harmonious family when my kids get married, but maybe a step or two off so they can add a unique flavor or personality inside the little culture of the family tree. And so I do believe that we can see a larger multi-generational family, or as we had in our previous conversation, right? Um, the house of prior being multiple different family types, but all helping to push each other up and every successive branch up towards success and their calling and their purpose in life. Yeah. Yeah. This, this is definitely the, the edge of our, our kind of current thinking and, um, and processing as well. So I, I think, you know, because we have now new branches coming online of the family and we have this really strong family culture that we've developed. Mm -hmm. Um, it's like, there is, there is some sweet spot, um, between, this sort of controlling, pushing vision that you described that I think does create a lot of resentment and frustration, um, but also like passing on the values, you know, the culture mm -hmm. of the family so that there is continuity. And sometimes that continuity is a mission. Like I could be called to a mission and there could be a branch of the family that, that feels called that, that mission. And then there's other branches that are, I think just God's given them new vision. And it, and, and mm -hmm. I think that part of what we want to do is, is let vision go both ways. You know, we, my daughter, um, Sydney, who's 20, she's, she has this passion for Korea, right? We've spent a lot of time in the Middle East, but this is like something that's super exciting to her. And it's been going for two, three, four years, I guess now. And so, you know, she's going to head to Korea and, uh, you know, be a part of a program there. And so I, I, you know, we're constantly praying, okay, what, what, God, what are you bringing into our family? What, how are you expanding this family vision? Um, so I think that seeing that these, that, potentially new branches will have elements of the, that original DNA, but they're bringing in their own DNA. 
And so mm-hmm. there, we have to figure out this sweet spot so that we, we're not resetting every generation. We're working together. We can do common assignments together. Um, and, but, but not controlling or, or creating some kind of, um, yeah, this, this heavy expectation using resources to try to limit our, our kids ability to, to do what God's actually called them to do that. That, that is, that is a really challenging thing to figure out how, how to get that right. I was just watching a, um, this amazing, so I watched a play last night. My wife and I went to this play called the chosen. Um, it's not related to the TV show, um, that is about Jesus, but it's about, it's a book by Chaim Potok and it's a incredible story. Both April and I read the book. We, we've loved the book. Uh, there's a movie as well, but this play was incredible, uh, depiction of it. And it really is the story of, so, uh, two fathers and two sons. Um, both fathers are trying to push their vision onto their sons. One is like, uh, it's incredibly specific, you know? Um, we, we tell our kids all the time, we joke, there's this, this line in, in Horton Hears a Who where the, the father says, you can be whatever kind of mayor you want to be. <laughs> it's like, a, my, the vision's is sky high. It's like, but it, you have to be a mayor. Like, and this is a similar situation. This rabbi is telling his son, you must be the next rabbi. Like it, it, hmm. it is everyone who's in this family. The firstborn son is always the next rabbi. Well, that is like, you know, anathema to Western individualism. And, and it was clear this kid was not built to be the next rabbi. And so, um, and so he, all, he, he, so all the pressures were just coming to bear on this ultra Orthodox Jewish family. And it was just like watching this, this thing get cranked up in intensity and the whole crowd is like, we're crying. It's just like so intense. You could tell the mm-hmm. father really, really, really loves his son. Um, but, but he has this very controlling, very specific vision, um, for the son's whole life is planned out basically when he's born, including his wife and everything else. And the son is just not, not built for it. And, and it's like, just sitting there in the tension for two hours, watching this thing play out. Um, yet in, in Jewish families, you have this incredible continuity generationally. Mm-hmm. There was, there's mm-hmm. this moment in the, in the play where the father comes to the son and acknowledges, look, you're not going to be the next rabbi. I understand that. But can you carry on these values of our family? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, father, I will do that. And I was like, that's the moment everybody just like lost it because they found that exact thing we're talking about. Right. Yep. They found that sweet spot as hard as it was for that family. So yeah, I love, I love trying to figure that out. I'm glad you guys have thought through that and, yeah, and trying to figure that out is so important. Um, it it, it is. I, I mean, your family is bigger than just you, but it's better because of you, right? Just like your family tree is bigger than just one individual leaf. If you represent a leaf, but without any leaves, the whole the, the whole thing dies. And so I love that. Um, hey, can you at least carry on these values and? If you think about our trees and, and branches building upon branches, hey, you are going to have substantial core values that a large log, for lack of better words, sticks out and has hundreds or thousands of branches building off of it. Um, and still within the same tree, you might have a different value over here that has hundreds or thousands of values. And it's, um, yeah. You could be any kind of mayor you want to be. <laughs> I like it. That one's stuck in me. That one's stuck in me. I love that movie. Oh my gosh, it's it's yeah, it's it's, it's a it, the same exact kind of tension. I, we love watching. There's so many good books and movies with this question, and I think that one of the problems is we we are getting this wrong, and, and oftentimes it's a generational like uh, seesaw effect. So you have one generation, and there's just it was very rigid. You will be this. We mm-hmm. are passing the business down to you, whether you like it or not. You know, I mean, it, you will live here. You will have this many children. <laughs> it's like just way too, way too specific vision from, from some kind of, uh, the, the patriarch of the family. Mm-hmm. And then, and then you have the complete abdication of the next generation where it's like, we're not going to give our kids anything. I'm going to cut you off at 18. Good luck, you know, like with your life. And, there's, we're not going to get like, there's no vision. There's no, there's no connection. There's no culture. There's no identity. And, and, and that's what I find so powerful about calling over identity. Cause I think there's elements of identity. I don't know if you guys dig into this. I'm curious, like, so there's identity in terms of how the individuals of the family are built, but then there's also a historic identity, which is part of what this mm-hmm. play was attempting to, to, to begin to, um, to, to describe, uh, and, and within Jewish families, you see this so deep, like, like a lot of where the identity comes from is that around the Shabbat table, you're hearing about, you know, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 generations. 
of mm-hmm. the family mm-hmm. and stories and what we went through. And then, you know, your great, 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 great grandfather did this and grandmother did this and all this. And so it's it just, you're a 12 year old kid going just infused with all this identity that's coming from the past, which, which carries with it, you know, values like mm-hmm. resilience or like things that your family went through that are just, they're being in, basically installed into you through family storytelling. So yeah. How, how have you guys seen the impact of the past generation, especially because in this culture, many of us don't have any idea where we came from. I mean, we can't, That's right. you know, it's just like, it's like a blank slate back there. Um, yeah. How, how have you guys interacted with, uh, with, with the idea of, of the past or, or roots? Um, for, for I think it's, it, it's exactly like you're saying, I mean, understanding that you are part of a bigger picture and understanding that you are part of a common picture in one big thing. Um, so, uh, I had, I'll take it to chicken. Um, I had a buddy who his whole job was to go open up franchises, local franchises of a chicken fast food restaurant across the country. And I asked him, I said, okay, David, okay. But how does that work? Because I am sure the, the Kane's chicken here in Oklahoma city has a completely different culture than the store in Baton Rouge or Denver or Chicago or wherever it is. And he goes, no, 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 Derek, you think too small. Um, the Oklahoma city store has a different personality, but they all have this part of the same culture. Mm. And I think that's the connection there is understanding, Hey, when we are part of something that's bigger than us, multi-generation, 30, 40, 50 generations, when we're grafted into um, the, the Israelites, I mean, we're the, we're the ones that are grafted in. They're not grafted in us. Right. And, you know, we're grafted into this gigantic story that, that laces throughout the entire Bible. Yeah. Hey, our family can have a personality, but it's all, it, it's all carried through values of, of a similar culture. Yeah. And, and I think that's how we, we can think of it. We don't, don't always, I don't always, but I think we can. Okay. Different personality, but all the same culture. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I think those differentiations are really important to explore. Uh, I like that because yeah, you're going to get, you don't want to reset culture every generation if possible. I mean, there, there are hard won lessons that a generation can, can win and know that it's not just going to die with them. I mean, why mm-hmm. would, what, what good is that? This is the reason why I think a lot of people become obsessed with sports or work or anything else besides the family, because it feels like things that are in the family don't last. Uh, Mm -hmm. But you know, when you go to these multi-generational families and you see the amount of impact that these stories have, um, then you can, you can say, Oh, there is a, there is a way to transmit DNA, not just physical, but, but culture, cultural down Mm -hmm. the generations. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think, one of the things we've discovered is you, if you encode those into specific rhythms, um, they, they have a, a much higher degree of likelihood to continue, uh, multi-generationally. Fortunately, now that we've, we've lived, um, as a human species for long enough, you can look at the cultures where this is happening and it is, I don't, I don't really don't know of a, of a better example than the Jewish culture with some of the actual rhythms and, and you see God himself installing that DNA all the way back in the old Testament saying, mm-hmm. you know, celebrate this Passover. And when you celebrate it and your son asks, why do we do this and this and this, tell him this and this and this, he's like giving them direct, this is how you pass on DNA. You create these rhythms, you repeat them on some kind of regular weekly or annual basis. And this, in, this in, initiates a conversation with the next generation. And then as you have that conversation, these, these cultural values get passed on and get imbibed by that that generation. So that, that process is, I think, really important. Which is a win, right? You talk about, Hey, it's easy to get involved in sports and work. Well, it's also really easy in those uh, areas to look at a scoreboard figuratively and to know if you're winning or losing. Yes. Oh, Hey, I'm moving the needle here or I'm not. I I know if I'm winning or losing. And we all, we all like to win. Mm. Even if it's at a game of chess or checkers, we want to win. Um, and so, by defining what those wins are for a family, even if it is rhythmic or cultural wins, understanding that is good. The Shabbat is a great example. Hey, a Jewish family that has sat down for zero Shabbat dinners in the last 12 months, but say 
it's important for us to have those those meals on a consistent basis. Hey, there's a really easy scoreboard there now that you've identified it and there's a gap that we need to close. Yeah. And so whatever those cultural, I believe, whatever those cultural or relational or spiritual goals or wins are, if we can just identify them, then we can hit them with a dart on a target because saying better, better isn't a goal. Right. Yeah. Be- better no. constantly moving. You know, we got to, we got to clarify. Well, I, I'm, yeah, I'd love to, for you to maybe describe some examples of that because I do think that's a huge problem. I think the reason why sports are so intoxicating is because of it's so clear. It's the clarity that that I know who won, I know who lost, I know what the score is, I know who won the championship. And I think that gets guys especially like yep. that clarity is so important because it, then we know we're 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 progressing and that we're competent and you know and even if we've lost, we know how to we know how to win like. It, that 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 is so important and in the family it just seems like this big confusing you know realm where nothing no no one ever knows if we're winning no one else, you know we don't know when we're losing we you know it's it's not it's not essentially competitive and so this is this is uh this makes it a little challenging like how how do we do that so yeah give me any examples or any thoughts about it. how do we clarify this for families yeah sure so i think it, it begins with again going back to when you know who you are you'll know what to do Okay. So for uh, for our family, we've got five core values: radically protecting quality time, quality time, enduring family unity, unwavering integrity, radically protect. Uh, I'm sorry, excellence in everything, and prayerful in decision making. And so that becomes um, the the parameters, the guidelines, the the boundaries of the decision making tool. Right. Then you can set long arc, three year, five year goals. Again, right. not pushing vision down because well, it's a win. If every generation is a rabbi, well, not really. Right. I mean, right. but Hey, it, it's a win. If every generation is spiritually close and walking with a relationship with Christ or like, Hey, we can talk about that stuff. Um, and then sitting down together with those being the boundaries of the box and saying, okay, guys, what are some three year, five year, 10 year goals? If we have enduring family unity, Let's define what that looks like in three years or five years so that we know what we're aiming to towards and, and hitting. Um, prayerful and decision-making is one that's really easy for us because the question is, hey, I think I'm going to go do this. Did you pray about it? Yes or no? <laughs> <laughs> like, that's like, real easy. You know, yes. yes, you did. No, you didn't. Uh, okay, I need to do that. <laughs> that's great. Man, that's so good. Well, I, I kind of want to take a step back. I love trying to understand for for um, an organization like you, yours, who's encountering so many families. And you said, you know, you're, you and your wife both came from broken homes and uh, and now are experiencing this. Like to try to try. Let's, let's just. I'd love to get your thoughts on just what is what has happened to the family. Um, we can talk about this from sort of the bigger perspective in the West or, or within the church as well. Um, because I, I think that you can't solve problems unless you, you really understand the mm. root causes of the problems. And so I really like to spend time trying to understand how people think about why is the family in so much crisis in our culture? Um, you know, I think it's a multifaceted, multivaried problem. So we could explore any part of the variables that you guys are, are keen on. But as you have families coming into, you know, the family ID process and, you know, you're coming to an event, really working through these things. And obviously you guys, I'm sure see the brokenness and the challenges, the families, what they're trying to recover. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. How, how, have, how have you started thinking about the nature of the problem that the family's facing? For us, that, I mean, to sound cliche, Jeremy, it all goes back to identity. Um, right. and, and, and that's really our differentiator in the market is yeah. uh, there are some big name organizations, ministries that focus on marriage or parenting or uh, relationships, whatever it is, but I believe until right. you've nailed down identity, mm. you you can't you don't know where those targets are on marriage or relationship or parenting. You can get better, but yeah. hey, this is the type of parent I want to be. And so first, you have to identify that. Do you, do you think um, there's something that, that where that got lost? Like where 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 would you where would you say that that where did that go off the rails? Um, I, I don't know if I could pinpoint a, a day and a time, okay. but I think culture spins billions of dollars trying to capture the hearts and imagination of each one of us and our future generations. And I think when we lose, when we lose 
the idea that our family is our first and most important ministry, that's, that's when it completely goes sideways because we have to, I, I believe we as parents, grandparents, great grandparents have to consider ours as the first, not only, but the first and most important ministry to work on and to create a vision that does, that is so beautiful and, and encapsulating that it grabs the hearts and minds of, of each member of the family so that they understand, like our conversation, you are part of something so much bigger and yeah. so much greater, and you make an incredible difference in that. We need yeah. you to be a part of that. Yeah. Not, hey, if you drive a Chevy Silverado, then you become a man. It, like, <laughs> right. it, yes. Yeah, nothing we have these... against Silverado, but yeah. <laughs> They're great. Yeah, we, we have these uh, these markers of identity, I, I, and I, they, they do, and the way I would describe what you're saying is the, um, it seems like what occurred is that in the West, we began to adopt, adopt a hyper-individual identity. Like what you hear? Be sure to leave a rating and review for this podcast wherever you use streaming. And so mm -hmm. there, there's, a, there's a natural tension between family identity and the individual identity. And, and it's to the extent now that I think, I think that parents actually might feel like they are doing their children a disservice to provide identity in any way that comes, that flows from the family to the child because it violates their individuality. Mm -hmm. So you want a child to be radically free, radically able to invent their own identity. Now, nobody can invent their own identity. It's really discovered. And so part of the problem is that when you tell children that, like you're, you you got to go figure out who you are, then usually the, the people who do imprint their identity are their peers, right? And so that's they right. see these, that's why these social contagions are happening because kids have no identity. Parents are clueless about the fact that you can't send children into the world without an identity. Mm -hmm. And when you do, their peers are going to call them something or say something or suggest something, or they're going to sit in class and hear a teacher say something. And then they're going, maybe that's who I am. Maybe that's who I am. And and so this, this, uh, this uh, idea that you can only form individual identities, I think, like, and the church seems like it's, we've not really combated this properly. Like we're, we're not saying, Hey, no, 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 you guys, there's, you know, what we do is say, no, within, within Christ, you can have a, a new personal identity. Um, but there's not an understanding that the Bible also does what you're describing. And that is it, it calls families like it, it, Abraham, the whole promise of the Messiah was that it doesn't say every individual it says every family of the earth will be blessed through you. And what's mm -hmm. fascinating too in the book of Acts is that, and you know, I, you rarely see theologians really um, grapple with with this, but you have one after another story of household salvations, which is, you know, you can get into the theology of that. But the reality is, when Luke was recording Acts and the Holy Spirit was moving, it was it was from house to house, it was family to family, it was it was all these households getting saved um, as 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 whole households, and you know, we would never write a book like that today because we would be concerned that it's going to violate the, you know, sort of the, the cult of individualism that mm -hmm. we're, we seem to all be buying into. So I, it seems like there's a lot of tension. I don't know if you guys have worked out like s some of that, but that, that's where I feel a lot of it when I'm talking to families in our culture today. I think you're absolutely right. No, we haven't solved it all. <laughs> I'll leave with that. No, <laughs> but I agree and, and entirely agree. And, and I think I heard a pastor say it once of, um, hey, his job as a parent, and, and I took it on as my job as a parent, um, is within the realm of my, of my values, I want my kids to be successful. And I'm willing to not when they're 18, cut them off and go push them out and say, hey, find your identity. But it's a two-way trust relationship. Um, I, I love what you're talking about. Your daughter who is interested in Korea, and yet you and your wife or can sit in that consultant seat because you have gained and garnered trust that she can say, what is a wise decision? What is wise counsel? And you're saying, this is wise counsel. It might not be me, but I can pull in the right people because there is a relationship of trust. And then when the decision is made, you're willing to, to leverage everything you can, relationships, maybe some finances, uh, opportunities, connections, you spent your entire life creating this, um, I don't know, warehouse of yeah. values and valuables, and you're giving her the keys to say, look, 
because I trust you, you can have access to the whole warehouse. Let's go make it happen, baby. Come on. That's right. Um, <laughs> but without trust, you're going to hold those keys real tight. Yeah. And without trust the other way, the, the next generation isn't going to open up and even ask for advice or direction because it, they don't feel supported. Um, and it's that two-way trust that I think kills the independence and, and the hyper-individuality of the future generation. It's, a, it's an interdependence of, right. hey, if you'll trust me now when you are unsure, when you feel like you know where God's calling you to go, I will trust you then because you've demonstrated it. Yes. Let's go. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, they, I think that the thing that I want my kids to really believe is that we're that whatever visions God gives them, you, you're going to go so much farther if we partner together in some way. Mm -hmm. And it, we, I don't know what that's going to look like. It could just be resourcing with this resource or that, like a connection, or but it could be like you know much deeper. Like our kids, we've had. Um, situations every time our kids go overseas and, and do um things in in totally new networks like our, our son was in south africa um our daughter was in, in norway um we you know we're planning the same thing in korea we will go usually about halfway into their trip just to see what how can we help you how what, is there mm -hmm. anything that you've met anybody you want us to meet anything we can resource mm -hmm. um, and every mm -hmm. time there's just like a huge opportunities for our whole family to 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 really be extended um, through what our children have, have established, you know, as, as really new beachheads of the family in, in different areas. Um, and so it's, it has been, it has been so much fun in this season to watch my kids, um, you know, go out and fire those arrows in different places of the world and just get to experience the, um, just the expansion of the family because that trust that you're describing has been built over, you know, the, the 20 years that we've been, a family living, living together. And we have all the advantages in the world, just all the time in the world, just to be as our kids are young to establish that a deep mm -hmm. trust so that, um, and I think that what I really get frustrated with, uh, is to have invested for 18 or 20 years in that incredibly, uh, deep relationship. And right at the moment where it's about to bear the most fruit for the kingdom, you just artificially cut it off and say, in, it's in your best interest to, to have no identity from this family because, we don't want to violate your individual freedom. And so go out there and try to figure all this out on your own. Um, that, that is, that is, that is going, going too far. So that interdependence yep. is really what we're trying to, it's not easy as we've been having this conversation. Like we haven't, you know, figured out the exact calibration. You have to really be in relationship with somebody to find that. Um, am I being too controlling, too suggestive, you know, too directive? Am I being under, am I under resourcing? If I'm, am I being too passive? Um, I, I ask that question literally every single day about mm -hmm. at least one of the, my relations with my kids. Like, do I have this calibration right? Um, and I, I find constantly scenarios where I feel like I'm I'm going too far or not going far enough. Um, and so it's not easy. This is part of why we need to be in that close relationship and find that space. Uh, absolutely. I mean, then she wants you and your wife to come visit her halfway through. Yes. She wants to include you in it. Uh, and not just so that you can put her favorite snacks in your backpack and That's bring right. them over there, but, but we she will wants do to that. celebrate. Yeah. <laughs> but she wants to celebrate with you because you've been great coaches and consultants. I, I'm sure you've heard, or, or some of the audience has heard, um, J.H. Range and talking about the roles of parenting. Uh, um, yes. The journey of transition. You know, yeah. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Journey of transition as, as they talk about going from caretaker to cop, to coach, to consultant. Yes. Um, and, we, my kids being 15 and 14, I mean, we, we just made that transition from cop to coach. And I probably reach back to cop every once in a while and, <laughs> and still cop a little bit, Yeah. but coaching is great because you can build them up. And I was talking with a buddy yesterday at lunch and what does a coach do? Well, they see potential, they call out potential, they encourage, they refine they run plays, they run drills, they they help to develop and take somebody to a level. And, and because they are doing that in a trustworthy way, great trust and relationship is built so that, and I'm sure you do a great job, Jeremy, of being a great consultant with your daughter and saying, okay, you've called me in to solve this one problem. I might see a couple other ones, but I'm going to solve this problem right now. 
and I'm not going to try and solve all of them right now. Yeah. I might let you know, I see some other indications, but for right now, let's try to solve this one problem or manage this one tension. Yeah. Yeah. That, that is, that dance is, is so delicate. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, and I, you don't want to fall off on one side or the other is, is I think what we're both saying. Yeah. I think that that's the temptation. Uh, the temptation to say I'm all out or I'm totally in and controlling. That's that's so, right. Yeah, we got to find that 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 balance. Awesome. Well, Derek, this has been really great. I, I would love for you to maybe share um, like next steps with anyone listening to this that gets is getting excited. Oh my gosh, I want to I want to more know more about my family um, identity. Well, what can they do? What what are the steps? What are some ways for them to to learn more? Uh, the easiest is family id.com. Okay. Um, on there is there's big buttons for to take the assessment. That's completely free. We want it to always be free. Um, our heart is to minister to families. Under the resources, there's the video masterclass to go through the courses um, and, and walk that through either as a family or as a small group of families. Um, that's completely free. So please take advantage of that. And uh, we want that to be free to minister. So family-id.com. That's the way. Very cool. Hey, yeah, you guys take advantage of that. I, I, I'd love to hear and let me know what you learned about your family identity. What, what are some things that ways that it's helping you? Uh, so dive into the assessment and into the master class. And I think it's a great idea to go through it with a group of families. I think this is a great step into, um, yeah, continue to go deep, deeper into what unique ways God has designed your family and give your kids a lot more clarity around that, that score and what it means for us to, to really win as a family. So mm -hmm. thank you so much for what you and Greg are doing. This has uh, really been um, super helpful for me to understand more about, about your ministry and excited to continue to, to, to collaborate and partner in whatever ways we can as we move forward. Thank you, buddy. Thanks for having us today. This is a great conversation. Thank you for listening to the Family Teams podcast. If you're enjoying this content or have learned something new, please make sure to leave a rating and review and share with a friend. To stay up to date with our events, new content, and products, you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Family Teams.